everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Congressman John Larson. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me. Good to be with you, Brittany. You've been a leader in Congress when it comes to Social Security. Recently on the House floor, you've expressed your frustration about the lack of movement on the issue. And you said this, quote, Congress has not acted since 1971 to enhance and improve anything about Social Security. So can you talk to us here a little bit about your concerns? Well, as you know, Brittany, Social Security is the nation's number one anti-poverty program for the elderly. It's also the number one anti-poverty program for children. And imagine the last time that Congress has acted to enhance the program, Richard Nixon was president of the United States. That was back in 1971. Let me add that both Eisenhower and Nixon, two stalwart Republicans, enhanced Social Security because they knew of the success of the program. But it's been more than 50 years since Congress, which is the only body that can change and enhance Social Security, has not taken direct action. And suffice it to say, I think for your viewers, they all understand that a lot of things have changed since 1971, including course- the economy and the cost of living. Of course, and as you know, as I'm sure your constituents know, our viewers know, the economy is one of the top issues facing Americans as we sit here right now. Social Security is a concern, especially for older Americans. Why has there not been movement on this in 50 years? And you've been in Congress since 1999, so where's the solution? It defies any semblance of logic. Uh, For some, they've called Social Security the third rail. But there's an element that believes that Social Security is socialism. Uh, They feel that it costs too much money. But if you examine Social Security, and as the president said in his State of the Union message, really there's a large, a vast group of people, because as you know, Brittany, Social Security is capped. President Biden has said, let's lift the cap on people over four hundred thousand dollars of income now that's six tenths of one percent of the american people but for many of them they either pay nothing into social security because they avoid the payroll tax altogether or they're done paying if they're millionaires in february if they're billionaires january 2nd while every other american who's part of the program pays throughout the course of the year So to lift that cap would allow us to enhance benefits that haven't been enhanced in more than 50 years and then also extend solvency beyond 2066, both of which are vitally important and why Congress needs to act. And what's frustrating, I think, to the American people is all they're asking of Congress to do is vote. That's why we put out Social Security 2100 which follows a number of the president's uh, suggested changes to it, including an increase across the board for everyone, making sure uh, that uh, 23 million Americans who are currently still working and receive Social Security, that their Social Security benefits aren't taxed, lifting people who have worked all their lives and paid into the system who get a below poverty level check from Social Security, creating a new floor for Social Security, repealing the onerous WEP and GPO uh, formulas that were put in place back in the 1980s, the last time that Congress actually looked at Social Security and extended its solvency, but it did so by raising the age. And that's the misnomer that I think a lot of people don't understand. Uh, Currently, Republicans say, well, you know, people are living longer. Well, yes, that's true. They are. And we're happy to see that. Now, the pandemic may slightly change that, but nonetheless, they are living longer. But for every year you raise the age, that's a 7% cut in benefits. So let me get this straight, Brittany. How does it make sense that if you're living longer, a program hasn't been adjusted in more than 50 years, that you're going to be living on less, uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. But I think that story hasn't been told. And that's why we put out Social Security 2100, 
We have over 190 plus sponsors already. Uh, we think uh, we'd like to see it brought up this year. We'd like to see it brought up. And I know if it goes to the floor, my colleagues on the other side are going to vote for it. But there has been a philosophical disagreement over this, over some who believe that everybody ought to be able to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and there's no need for governmental programs, et cetera. The great irony, of course, is they call it an entitlement. But as you know, this is not an entitlement. This is an earned benefit. And people, all they have to do is go to their pay stub and they look at it and it says FICA. What does that stand for? Federal insurance contribution. Who's? Theirs. And they understand it. It's an earned benefit that has no impact on our debt or deficit. Another bogus claim that is made by the other side. It's a separate trust fund that's there for the American people that they have paid for. I can hear how passionate you are, Congressman. And you said this now. You've also said this on the House floor over a year ago, that Social Security is not an entitlement. It's an earned benefit. So where do you, where do, what do you think is missing then from the national dialogue when it comes to Social Security? Because you said this story has it. That's a story that hasn't been told yet when it comes to the age. So what's missing here? I think what's missing here is the willingness to vote. And currently the situation, whether the House or the Senate, but I'm more familiar with the House, is that they won't even bring it up in the committee uh, for a vote. And so I don't understand the fear because many Republicans have said to me privately and candidly that they would vote for this bill, et cetera, but their leadership and their contributors have a problem for it. And this is another thing I don't understand. For every business that pays part of the Social Security, meaning the employer pays part and, and the employee pays part, but the employer gets a tax write-off for that part. So it's not costing the employer anything. And what it's doing is help shrink, as you pointed out earlier, the vast wealth gap that exists. Imagine Five million Americans, most of them, by the way, Brittany, women, get below poverty level checks from the government, having worked and paid into the system. Why? Because they were the care providers, because they were home with their children or a sick person in their family. And while they were working, as you also know, they were making far less than their male counterparts. Now, fast forward to today, 10,000 baby boomers a day become eligible for Social Security. That's why I think that especially as those baby boomers are having their kitchen table discussions and talking with their accounts, attorneys or just family members saying, hey, what's the deal with this Social Security? Yeah, we paid into this. Why hasn't there been an adjustment or a change that would reflect the needs that exist today? And that's what we hope to do with Security 2100. And to your point, I mean, Social Security really should transcend party lines. It affects Republican Americans, Democrat Americans. I am curious, what are those private conversations with your colleagues looking like, especially those ones across the aisle? Well, my favorite conversation was uh, with Mark Meadows. You may recall Mark who went on to be Trump's chief of staff, but he was one of the original founders of the Freedom Caucus. And he said very candidly, he said, listen, you know, these issues, especially as it relates to Social Security, he said, I understand what that means in rural uh, North Carolina. That's a lifeline for all of our people. And that, and that is so true for or, over 40 percent of all Americans on Social Security. It's the only benefit they have. So one of the things I've been doing, uh, and you might appreciate this, I don't know if you can see this, this card at all, but what I do is I make a card for every single member of Congress, House and Senate, and on it, it has their district, how many Social Security recipients they have, and then breaks it down to the Social Security recipients for pension, the spousal um, contribution, the dependent contribution, and the disability contribution. For example, 
more veterans rely on Social Security disability than they do on the VA. And then most importantly, we also add how much money comes into your local congressional district on a monthly basis. There's no better economic development plan. There's no greater way to close this gap when we have both a global pandemic and global in inflation than to make sure that the very people in your district that need it the most are going to be able to get an increase to help them survive. And where do they spend that money? Right back in the communities they live in. They spend it at the local grocery store, at the pharmacy where they pump gas, they pay their rent or mortgages, the money comes back locally. Nobody's going to get wealthy on Social Security payments. On average, a Social Security payment for a male is $18,000. For a female, is $14,000. And as we indicated earlier, for $5 million are getting below $12,000 for their Social Security payment to live on for a year. Uh, things have changed a lot since 1971, but what needs to change most of all is for the American people to be outraged and say, hey, Congress, how about a vote? If you got a better idea than Social Security 2100, by all means, put it on the floor. But to say that we need to study this, the American people, American economists, they everybody understands Social Security. There's nothing to study about it. Either you are going to cut benefits or increase revenues so that you can enhance the program. Uh, there's a lot that we could do with efficiencies, et cetera. But so far, the other side has said what they intend to do is cut Social Security by 21 percent across the board. As you said, Social Security is a lifeline for many older Americans. So what do you think is the biggest threat facing the program? I think the biggest threat facing the program is congressional inaction. The American people completely understand and it all you know, demonstrate that Republicans, independents and Democrats all believe even polls that say if you personally had to pay more, would you do so? And they say, yes. Why? Because it's a guarantee. You know, we used to have to go back to 1929 and cite the great crash. But now you only have to go back to 2008, 2009, when people saw their 401k become a 101k and experienced losses that they hadn't before. And during that same time, Social Security never missed a payment, not a disability payment, not a spousal, not a dependent or a pension payment was missed by the 70 million people that get Social Security. Do you think people in their 20s, people in their 30s, when they reach a retirement age, are they going to see Social Security? That is a, that's a conversation amongst younger people. It is, and the only reason they won't is if Congress doesn't act. And you hit the nail on the head with the hammer. That's what a lot of people believe long term on the other side, that the way ultimately to beat Social Security is to make sure and constantly say, oh, we, we support Social Security, but then undermine it and cut it so that future generations will not believe that it's there, while at the same time saying, hey, there's a better way for you to utilize your money. And that's always been the philosophical disagreement that you can make more money in the private sector. There's no denying that at different points and different times and depending upon success, you can make more money, but you can also lose money. I went to the Aetna School of Insurance and they taught us very well about the three legs on the economic stool, your personal finance and your assets, your pension and what you put in savings. And the third leg, social security. And the only one that's never missed a payment and the only one that's a guarantee is Social Security, which is why Americans across the board, independents, Republicans and Democrats overwhelmingly support the program. 
I do want to get your reaction to some recent commentary from former President Donald Trump. He said this on the campaign trail, quote, if the millions of Biden migrants are allowed to stay as Joe Biden intends, they will cost taxpayers trillions of dollars and Medicare and Social Security will buckle and they will collapse. What are your thoughts on this type of dialogue? Well, first of all, uh, we need uh, immigration reform, which comprehensive immigration reform, which has been before the Congress. And again, like Social Security or like, again, aid to the Ukraine, it simply hasn't been taken up. But having said that, as you know, we're a nation of immigrants. And by the way, those immigrants who come here before they can even remotely collect Social Security, they have to be citizens, but they pay into the system all the time that they're here. So right now they are actually an asset uh, to the system of Social Security and Medicare, not detracting for it. And uh, President Trump also has said, you know, he likes to have it both ways uh, quite often. He said that he's very much in favor of Social Security, but then says that Social Security, you know, has the age has to be raised and make no mistake about it. And uh, don't take my word for it, you know, Call on uh, Social Security Works or the National Committee to Preserve and Protect Social Security, the Alliance for Retired Seniors, everyone, more than 350 groups have come out and supported Social Security 2100 and also have warned against raising the age as a way to fix this problem. What that simply means is you're cutting benefits. You don't think raising the age is a fix here, but you do think uh, Social Security 2100 is. Can you dive a little deeper in there, talk about what's in the bill specifically? Well, specifically, let's start with a 2% across the board increase for all recipients. Secondly, making sure that no one can work all their lives, contribute into the program, and get a below poverty level check from their government, which is why uh, the new floor for Social Security will be 125% of whatever the poverty level is determined by the, by the government. So no one is going to get below poverty level checks. From it. Uh, we also find that a number of people who continue to work out of necessity found themselves in a situation where their Social Security was being taxed. They've already paid taxes on that. That's double taxation. We repeal that and change that so that 23 million Americans will get a tax break because they won't be paying on that Social Security tax that they currently are under the law. We repeal Weapon GPO, again, another uh, program that was instituted during the 1983 so-called reforms, and that impacts not only teachers, but municipal employees, including firefighters and police and other municipal workers, et cetera, who have paid into the system uh, or husbands have paid into the system or our wives, and they're not able under the way the law is currently written to receive the social security be benefits that they've paid into the system. So we're out to repeal that. There's a number of bills to do that. But again, our bill pays for that, citing that, you know, you don't want to damage the trust fund. We want to make the trust fund continually solvent. And so it has the ability to provide all these benefits and solvency well into the future. Democrats have supported this Also bill. relieved the, uh, uh, the waiting period for disability uh, and a, a, a number of other specific areas as it relates to making sure in the case of uh, where both parents have been deceased or separated, where a grandparent has to have custody of raising children during this time, we enhance those benefits, have children be able to stay on the program longer especially those that find them, themselves going on to college afterwards, et cetera. Uh, this is, we found very constructive in most of these we've gotten, and we've incorporated every Republican suggestion that they've given us, including one by my good friend, Vern Buchanan from Florida, who said, you know, we ought to receive a social security audit. Everybody ought to receive 
uh, month, excuse me, annually, a statement that reviews how much money you have in Social Security and what that means so that they can compare it side by each. We're totally supportive of that. We agree. And so that's why Republicans have got to stop cutting the Social Security Administration. How about this one, Brittany? How many people do you think realize that the Social Security Administration operates now, or now, mind you, it serves 70 million people currently, and it's operating administrative budget. What do you think that is? I think you're going to tell me, so let it rip. <laughs> under, under 1%. Find another government agency where they're operating under 1%. Everybody should be looking and studying and saying, hey, how is it that they've been able to be so effective? How is it that they're able to keep the cost down? Uh, the answer, I think, will become pretty intuitive when you don't have a middle person, where there's no commissions that are involved, et cetera. And the private sector, again, I come from an insurance capital of the world in Hartford, Connecticut. They get this and understand it as well. You know, they, you know, that is you're providing from the bottom up a solid floor and foundation, which is why at the Aetna they always argued there were three legs on the stool. So let's make that leg solid and secure. But let's also allow people, as Vern Buchanan has said, to say, all right, here's what I'm getting for Social Security. Ooh, what if I were able to do this with some of my other, you know, invest and show where else you could get your money? There's no, this isn't a contest between one or the other, but if there's only, if you can only have one, you want the guarantee, but you want to know that there's options out there to get to. And if you can take your payroll deduction and put some money aside in another plan, that's only going to enhance your retirement or enhance your future and your families. If you're incorporating those Republican suggestions in this act, have you gotten any Republican support for the Social Security 2100 Act publicly? Verbally, yes, but not publicly. Do you think that's one going to happen? One. I do. Well, a, I think in the case of a, a, num a bill of this nature, where there has been long-standing philosophical differences, where lines have been drawn long ago. There are hard barriers to knock down. But in a vote on a bill, looking everyone looking at the card that I gave them, they're going to vote their interest and the interest of their constituents and their district. Uh, this is, you know, probably the best um, economic development plan that we could do. And when members look at, you know, on average, most districts get 200 million a month coming into their district for their constituents. And again, it's not rocket science. Where do they spend that money? They're not buying stock options with it, I can tell you that. So then what's next for the legislation? Because you've reintroduced it last year. There is Democratic support. So what's the lifeline look here? Well, uh, let us hope uh, that in, uh, we applaud the president and his initiatives. Uh, but. Uh, you know, the president can't make Mike Johnson bring the bill to the floor. Uh, only the Republicans can do that. And if they won't, well, uh, we hope we'll be in a position to do that after November. I think this is going to be a major campaign issue be for the reasons I cited before. 10,000 baby boomers a day. So that's 3,650,000 yearly are going to be eligible and wondering why Congress hasn't acted as only Congress can. So when your constituents say, why hasn't Congress acted, what's your response? I said, it's a shame and it hasn't acted because there hasn't been the will to vote. and. Some would even say too, hey, the Democrats had control, you know, uh, you know, well, I've been in Congress 24 years, 25 years actually now, but only uh, four of those years that we had the House, the Senate and a Democratic uh, uh, president. And that was the closest we came. But there were other things like the Affordable Care Act, et cetera, 
that ended up taking precedent at that point. But I believe, because the President has stated now in two successive State of the Union messages and in his campaign that this is top on the agenda list, Hakeem Jeffries, whom we hope will be Speaker of the House, has also indicated that it's top on his list as well. So we feel very confident that there will be a vote under Democratic control. With that aside, though, there should be a vote tomorrow. Whether Democrats or Republicans or independents, whoever controls it, look at the need that exists out there. Again, no one's getting wealthy off of Social Security. These aren't windfall profits for anyone. This is mere subsistence. And when there's any discussion that's talked about the wealth gap, you have to look no farther than the most successful insurance program in the nation's history. Run with less than 1% administrative costs, number one. Number two, providing critical benefits to more than 70 million people and making sure that those benefits are going right back to the communities and the people that need them the most, serving as an economic plus for every one of the 435 congressional districts in all the 50 states. So as, as you've noted from the very beginning of this conversation, there hasn't been substantive action on this in over half a century. So will it take precedent, do you believe, only if Democrats control the White House, Congress, and Senate? One would hope that that's not the case, that no matter who is there, they're going to recognize that here are the facts, here is the overwhelming data. And I think the more like institutions and the more like opinion leaders like Forbes and yourself make this clear just on the basis of the facts alone, that people would say, hey, you know what? We really need to do this. And you know what? When we look at the polling data, the public is accepting of this because they understand what this means. And if we're going to help solve this issue, of wealth disparity, and there's no denying it, that it actually exists. Imagine 40% of all retirees, the only benefit they have is Social Security. And on average, that's 18,000 a male, 14,000 per female. So if that isn't enough to shake people up uh, and have them do the right thing, I don't know what is. Do I think if Democrats are in control of uh, the presidency, the Senate, and the House? Absolutely, because they know this is long overdue. Congressman John Larson, I really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome back anytime. Brittany, thank you. Look forward to it.